Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Shall I? Yeah, yeah. Today we'll be presenting the case of 33 year old male who is a known case of sickle cell anemia who presented with bilateral knee pain since one day. Okay. On 10 second assessment, patient was conscious, oriented and obeying commands. Airway was patent, no secretions, no pulling of saliva or gurgling. On breathing, patient was maintaining a respiratory rate of 18 per minute with a saturation of 98% at room air. Air entry was bilaterally equal and normal vesicular breath sounds. Okay. On circulation, patient had a BP of 140-90 mm Hg with a pulse rate of 86 per minute. All peripheral pulses were felt. At this time, two large IV bow cannulas were put and uh, since the patient was in painful crisis, we had given two pints of IV, bol IV fluids as bolus. Disability, GCS was 15 out of 15. On exposure, temperature, patient was febrile and patient was complaining of pain. So, initially we started him on injection PCM 1 gram IV. <laughs> okay. Adjuncts to the primary. What was the pain score? Pain score, patient was complaining 9 out of 10. 9 out of 10. Okay. So, we have a young male who is a known case of sickle cell anemia who was presented to us with one day history of history of onset of bilateral mm -hmm. knee joint pain. Okay. So, uh, so, so here we are dealing, we are, uh, diagnosis is very clear, we are dealing with an acute uh, sickle cell crisis, was occlusive crisis due to uh, sickle cell anemia. That is the first differential diagnosis that we should have when a patient is coming to this. So, uh, you started off with the initial assessment, then you started off with the pain management is the key. So, pain management, this one area where you have to uh, give morphine will be the preferred agent. So, uh, because the severity of the pain will be significant enough, so they need morphine and maybe they will be already, because these patients might be taking already analgesics. That history also you should ask, because whenever they have this vasoclusive crisis, they might be having some oral medications already, they would have taken some morphine before itself. So, that history also you should be asking, but uh, maybe I am uh, not required or if you are worried of giving an IV, you can give subcutaneous also, which has got very good absorption also and it can have a rapid pain relief. So, uh, morphine around uh, 3 to 5 mg of morphine you can give for this patient along with an antiemetic. Then you have to look for the reasons why he has developed this uh, crisis. So, what are the common reasons? Once you said is dehydration. So, uh, what will be the reason? He has been traveling. traveling. So, he has been traveling. So, one of the most common uh, trigger for the vasoclusive crisis is one is dehydration. Then, in any infection. Any infection. That is the next thing. Next. Then hypothermia. Hypothermia. The climatic changes. Then. Uh, then uh, uh, any pain. Any stress. stress any stress, stress itself stress. can cause. And pregnancy. pregnancy. A female patient pregnancy. So, these are the common risk factors that you need to see when there is a vasoclusive crisis. So, what is basically sickle cell disease? Sickle cell disease, there is polymerization of abnormal hemoglobin. Mm. In the beta chain, uh, glutamic acid will be substituted by valine at the mm. sixth position. So, what will happen to the shape of the RBC? Uh, shape of the RBC, there will be sickle shape. Okay. Resulting in vasoclusion, the sickle cells get sequestrated and it causes occlusion. occlusion of the so vessels. That is a, one of the uh, pathophysiology based behind this. And the most important, when we call sickle cell crisis, it is vasoclusive crisis. So, overall, you can have this vasoclusive crisis. You can start from the top to the bottom. If it happens in the brain, then it can cause a CVA or TA or seizures. Okay. Then if it causes in the pulmonary circulation, it can cause acute chest syndrome. Okay. Uh, then coming to the abdomen, it can cause a mesenteric ischemia. Coming to the renal, it can spleen. cause uh, spleen sequestration. Can and to the liver also. Liver also. Sequestration then. Uh, then uh, coming to the renal, it can cause renal failure. Mm. Coming to the digits, it can cause dactylitis in the patient. Then it can cause priapism in patients. Okay. Um, then to the joints, joints uh, avascular, avascular necrosis, necrosis very common be. avascular necrosis to the joint everywhere wherever there is a blood flow it can go us and uh, the obstruction so that is the most important thing. Then now coming to the most important common will be acute chest syndromes. What are the reasons for acute chest syndromes? There will be a sickling will be happening in the pulmonary circulation leading to pulmonary artery hypertension mm. which can go for core pulmonary okay. and then the patient develops severe dyspnea, saturation, fall. That is one reason. Then what else? It can cause infarction also. Infarction. To the lung segment it can cause infarction and sometimes it is very difficult to differentiate between a pneumonia and an infarction in this group of patients. So very difficult to tell that it is a pneumonia in a patient presenting with acute chest syndromes. So, that is the next thing. Then, overall it can cause an occlusion. 
what will happen the patient can have uh, imagine that the patient is not breathing well because of the pain and there will be atelectasis so atelectasis because of that there can be again hypoxia and carbon dioxide retention so we need to treat that hypoxia by supplementing oxygen okay. and most importantly this is one area we need to start incentive spirometry very early so in icus we will start incentive spirometry maybe this group of patient very early we should start incentive spirometry otherwise the pain will not be relieved so that is the regarding acute chest syndrome and uh, coming to the acute abdominal pain the most common as you said to the spleen to the liver and to the mesenteric ischemia so when such patients come to the ed what are our priorities what all you want any investigation when you ask me routinely immediately you don't need any investigations you need to start treatment maybe morphine around 3 to 5 mg of morphine you have started then followed by rehydration and next thing you have to look for any evidence of infection, infection. so if the patient has got any history of fever definitely we will go for infective markers but otherwise you need to look for the common reason why the patient have come in with crisis so there is no fever for this patient as such now so dehydration was the reason and you have started on, on IV fluids. Yes. Continue again. Uh, adjuncts to the primary survey, we had done a VBG to see the HB of the patient mm. and the HB was 10.7. Mm -hmm. Then we had done a CBC CRP to rule out whether any infection was there. Total count was 11.8 and CRP was 0. Okay. Uh, and coming and, to and if there is hypoxia, that is very important. You have to look for hypoxia also. If there is hypoxia, you need to supplement them with oxygen. But acute chest syndrome is not there. So, uh, we c it is not acute coronary syndrome. It is acute chest syndrome. It can cause an acute coronary syndrome also. It will come under that strategy itself. Then. Coming to the sample history, mm. a 33-year-old patient who was diagnosed to have sickle cell anemia at the age of 5 years. His both parents were sickle cell heterozygous okay. and the younger brother is also heterozygous. Okay. Patient was on folic acid. Uh, patient was started on hydroxyurea but stopped by himself due to GI issues. Mm -hmm. uh, he used to have recurrent febrile episodes requiring 1 to 2 transfusions per year. And he had uh, received 25 to 30 transfusions till the date. Okay. There was an history of bilateral hip replacement due to the vascular necrosis. Okay. And also he had an history of acute chest syndrome 5 years back which required NIV and ICU admission. Okay. Uh, then coming to the other systems, uh, respiratory and CVS was no, within normal limit. On parabdomen uh, examination, uh, parabdomen was soft but uh, spleen was enlarged and palpable. Okay. Uh, and on local examination, bilateral knee, there was mild swelling, right more than left and the movements were extremely painful. Uh, so, we had done an USG knee, bilateral knee, which showed a subcutaneous edema in bilateral knees with a mild effusion, right more than the left. USG abdomen was done uh, in view of splenomegaly. It showed a hepatomegaly, but spleen was not visualized. Okay. Okay. Later, then patient got admitted under hematology. Hematology. So, uh, basically, in an emergency room, when such patient comes, it's very easy for us to manage. It's easy to tell. But the problem is that you have to manage the pain. So, four or five things that you need to remember pain management dehydration and hypoxia management and look for the possible complications where all this patient can have starting from the brain, brain stroke as you said then coming to the chest you can have pulmonary infarction pulmonary embolism then you can have uh, uh, pneumonia also is a possibility infections can be there whether you want to give any antibiotics for this patient uh, if, uh, if in case of infection then we can give otherwise if there is um in uh, previous history of uh, infections also prophylactically yeah this is a high risk patient so maybe we can he's going to get admitted to the hospital maybe in this case we can start on maybe with a penicillin prophylaxis uh, and what will the other things that you wanted to do in him there is no hypoxia hydration after hydration how is pain improved nah, pain was improving so pain was improving so definitely one thing that you don't wait till you give uh, paracetamol and see how it is responding straight away go and give opioids so that is the uh, dictum in uh, pain management and uh, how fast you should give pain management it should be given within 15 to 30 minutes when the patient comes so that is up for any patient that is coming with pain to the ed for this here the pain will be so severe and they will not be able to tolerate any amount of pain because this sequestrated rbc's the flow will be limited and as a result they will go for vaso occlusion anything else that you wanted to add on for this patient so he had a history of complications already. Yes. He had an acute yeah, chest is. syndrome. He had a vascular necrosis. What would be the so-called uh, issues he had already? So uh, that's it. Okay. So our uh, take-home message: Whenever you get such a patient in the ED, our aim first hydrate the patient. 
pain management, morphine, opioids, any of the morphine and opioids. Then if it is not solving, you can think of other giving agents like paracetamol, maybe naproxen, all those things can be tried. And next down the line is the reason why he developed this. So here he has been having dehydration, which was the trigger for the same. So with dehydration, we have to correct and you will look for any hypoxia and uh, you have treated that. And if required, you need to start on antibiotics and refer to the hematologist for further management. So uh, when you want to do a transfusion in the sickle cell anemia? Uh, in, usually in sickle cell anemia, we keep the HB around slightly about 10. Okay. Uh, the, if there is an obvious uh, stroke or if uh, symptomatic anemia is there, then we can go for uh, otherwise, uh, any uh, prior to any surgeries also we can give transfusions. Otherwise, it is not routinely required for doing transfusion. And uh, can you just tell me about more about sickle cell anemia? How will you diagnose sickle cell anemia? Sickle cell anemia usually diagnosed with electrophoresis. Okay. We can look for the HBS and HBF, HBA ratios. Okay. Uh, then in this patient, HBS, uh, it, peripheral smear was taken which showed a HBS of 70%. Okay. Um, then the um, patient was started on medications like hydroxyurea. It was started with uh, 30 milligrams per kg per day. Um, OD was started. Look, he is married? No. He is married. So what will be the advice that you are going to give him? The he wanted to get married. So what is the advantage that you, what is the advice that you will give to him? No, sickle cell counsel about so Definitely the counseling has, has to be done. done. And uh, definitely there is a chance that the patient, it can be a treat mm -hmm. and there is a possible definitely she should not marry somebody who is having already sickle, sickle cell. cell. So that is going to be a disaster. So uh, then uh, the probability of their uh, offsprings is going to have is much more higher side. So that is the adv uh, advice that you will going to give to this patient. And uh, you said electrophoresis is the definite diagnosis and basically when you have doubt in your mind and high altitude, that is the another one. Uh, that can uh, precipitate this thing is high altitude. So precipitating factor, uh, we will come back again, dehydration, then fever, then uh, stress related, pregnancy, hypothermia. So this uh, during December and all, this is the usual time when we can have uh, onset of not in India, maybe uh, not, not in every part of India, some parts of India definitely yes. You can have patients with sickle cell anemia and then they can come to us.